You are now listening to Nailed It, the orthopedic surgery podcast. Dr. Shea, welcome to the Nailed the Ortho podcast. Happy to have you on. So welcome to the podcast. Well, thanks, Wendell. It's a pleasure to be here, and I'm, I'm excited to learn more about your whole a system and to be a participant. So I'm sure I'm going to learn a lot more from you than you'll ever learn from me. <laughs> well, we'll see. I'm sure you have a, a wealth of knowledge that you know I'll be happy to learn from as well. And at the beginning of our podcast, we typically start off with a couple of questions getting to know you. And reading up on you, you have a you know interesting background, interesting training that you've uh, that you've done you know throughout your life. And I know you've done some training in Italy um, when you do your fellowship. Can you kind of Tell us about how that experience was like. You know, we have a lot of resident listeners and fellow listeners, and some people may be considering, you know, doing some international fellowships or going other places. So what, you know, what are, what was that experience like for you? Yeah. And I, uh, gosh, um, when I've, I've had some remarkable international experiences and I encourage anyone if they have the time um, and maybe the opportunity to really look at it, I, I had a six week rotation in medical school in the Soviet union as it was breaking up. Um, wow. It was just kind of that process had been happening for a while. And Armin Hammer, who was the CEO of our uh, Occidental Petroleum, had gotten some of the original oil contracts in Russia uh, because of his fluency in Russian history, culture and the language. And so he uh, was very interested in cultural exchanges. And he created a program at UCLA um, with some of the my classmates who started an exchange program. And so I had the benefit of six weeks in multiple countries in both uh Leningrad, Moscow, but in, in uh, Russia, but also Leningrad, Moscow, or St. Petersburg, as Leningrad was called at the time, but spent a lot of time in the Baltic republics as well. And so that sort of sparked an interest in international healthcare and, and meeting with orthopedic surgeons in those parts of the world and learning new things. And then I had a, a fellowship in Switzerland with part of the AO, a group that was sort of a combination of uh, Gon's hip uh, problems, a guy named uh, Diego Fernandez, some hand and trauma work. And then I spent a lot of time uh, with the sports program there and learned a tremendous amount about sports were in that. And then I had a, a fellowship in Italy for Elizaroff. And I, I would encourage all of you to take advantage of the travel and some of these experiences because you'll see the world in a different way. And you'll, you'll be, uh, I think, impressed with how different people, different cultures, different resources come together to solve very similar orthopedic problems. And it, I think it creates a degree of humility that uh, sometimes you you think the way you've been taught to do things are the only way to solve a problem. And you'll learn a little humility that other people are solving similar problems, but perhaps with different ways, different resources, different approaches and getting very good results. And so um, I strongly encourage you all to do it. It changed my life. And uh, I, I love that international experience. And whenever I go to meetings, I really try to seek out people from other parts of the, the world to learn what they're doing and how that might change the way I think about what I'm doing. Yeah, that's that's awesome. I have a, a similar thought um, or a kind of similar mindset when it comes to things like that. And I'm actually this weekend supposed to be going to uh, Colombia to do a rotation for a month down in South America. So I'm hoping to get some, um, you know, to learn, you know, as much as I can and get some of these different experiences, uh, you know, that comes with this international travel. And, you know, that being said, how was the traveling sports medicine um you know, fellow experience. What was that like? Were you able to, you know, were you scrubbing in or what was it kind of more where you're going to different places? I know a lot of people are, have questions about it. And we've had some people that have, that have, uh, that have done that, that have been on the show, but I always, you know, find it really interesting to hear everybody's different perspectives on, um, at least on the traveling spell fellowship as well, when you're moving from one place to another. Yeah, they, I did the traveling fellowship uh, with AOSSM and, and was in the South American version. I think they have three versions. There's a European one, a South American one, and an Asian one. And I did the South American one. And um, you had just those things you mentioned, you get a chance to meet with people, socialize in the clinic, in the operating room. We got a little bit of all of those things together. And there's a lot of sort of uh, academic exchanges, cultural exchanges, presentation of cases, getting to meet the residents and fellows and the staff. But there's also a lot of social aspect to it. But the um, the combination of all of those things is really remarkable. But we did get a scrub, uh, do surgery, did some cadaver things, um, you know, kind of a, a comprehensive sort of social, cultural, medical experience. And if you can uh, make that happen, uh, once again, I, I encourage you to do so. I think it'll change the way you see the world. 
That's awesome. And, and last question I have here before we get started is, you know, we have a lot of people, even third and fourth year residents that are trying to decide what specialty they, they want to go into. And so what brought you more towards the field of like kind of this pediatric sports, um, you know, kind of these, these specialties, what brought you towards uh, those fields? Yeah. You know, um, I guess it was a couple of things. Um, when I came out of my training, yeah, there really wasn't a field of pediatric sports medicine. There've been some pioneering work uh, that had been done. Um, you know, Lyle McKelly did some remarkable things. Um, Carl Sanitsky, and there were a few other people, uh, Baxter Willis, um, Alan Anderson, some people who were a bit older than me who had done some really pioneering work, but it really hadn't gelled as a specialty. And um, so I kind of came into a field that in some ways didn't exist, at least not the level it is now. And so uh, I've always really enjoyed sports. And I had the privilege of spending about nine months with Bob Burks when I was a chief resident at the University of Utah doing kind of an extended sports experience. Um, and I learned a tremendous amount from Bob, but uh, to take the experience I'd learned from Bob and then combine it with some of the pediatric issues about open growth plates and how the, the procedures we might do in an adult to get a really good outcome might not be applicable to a child because of issues with growth plates kind of led to a lot of my, um, you know, developing interests in how do we do really good surgery that gets the good outcomes we get in the adult population that um, has to perhaps be altered to take into account the growth plate anatomy in pediatric patients. And so that was sort of my starting interest in pediatric sports. And uh, the field has really grown and progressed. Uh, I mean, there's a large number of pediatric orthopedic sports medicine practitioners now. And when I came out, there was a handful. And so it's been right. remarkable to see the growth over the last 20 years, in particular, the, the, the founding of the PRISM group, which was a collective effort from a lot of people. Um, it kind of, uh, the idea kind of incubated within the rock group. And then Hank Chambers, who was a, bit, a part of one of the founding members of the rock group, got involved with this idea of PRISM and the tremendous uh, background work, bylaws, fundraising, um, and Hank got PRISM going. And PRISM is a primarily a, a pediatric adolescent sports medicine group, which includes orthopedic surgeons, athletic trainers, physical therapists, primary care sports medicine, PhD researchers, concussion experts, you know, and, and so the PRISM group over the last 10, 12 years has really become a remarkable kind of pediatric sports medicine organization that's multidisciplinary. POSNA obviously is doing some remarkable work uh, now. Um, and then AOSSM, AOSSM and POSNA had a wonderful combined educational course this April, which I think was the sixth year of them doing cadaveric teaching, surgical teaching courses over the last maybe 13, 14 years. And so it's been wonderful to see that that growth from a small group of people, a handful of people in the room to now you can fill an auditorium. And so it's great to see those experiences. Yeah, no, I think that that's great. And that's awesome, especially how the field has you know evolved over time. Uh, and that being said, we can go ahead and, and transition to, to our topic of the day. We're going to talk a little bit about elbow OCD lesions. Um, so, Dr. Say, say, for example, you know, you get a 15 year old baseball player shows up to your clinic, you know, with some elbow pain. They've heard the term OCD turn, you know, thrown around before. But what what kind of what is like an OCD lesion and what is it stand like? What is the meaning of it? And then we can kind of go into some more detail here in a bit about OCD lesions in the elbow in particular. Yeah, um, it, we think that that. that OCD, osteochondritis dissecans, and you've got a nice kind of summary up here from the language, but yeah, we think of it as uh, dissecans as a dissection or separation. So a bone cartilage separation uh, that develops in any joint. We see it most commonly in the knee, but in males, most commonly in the elbow, second choice or second most common location is the elbow. In females, second most common location is the talus. And then it switches for third uh, for males and females for elbow. Um, but it's a, it's a distinct failure, uh, which we think probably starts with the bone first. There may be an issue with the quality of the bone, the vascularity of the bone that fails, and that leads to secondary problems with cartilage breakdown. Obviously, the surface cartilage requires structural support um, mechanically, but also nutrition-wise from the bone. And when that fails, that probably leads to the secondary failure problems of cartilage with delamination, dissection, and free bodies. And so the, the process of that Bone failure leading to cartilage failure, leading to exposed subchondral bone gaps and free bodies is probably similar, whether it's the, the knee, uh, the elbow, or the ankle. Um, the natural history may, is, may be a little different uh, for each of those joints, but the, the process and the underlying pathophysiology is probably pretty similar between all three joints. 
And, and when you specifically talk about OCD lesions of the elbow, what are we normally kind of referring to? Yeah, so typically in terms of location, uh, it's unusual to see them in the central or lateral part or medial part of the elbow. I have seen them there, but the typical area is the lateral aspect, kind of the radial capitellar joint. That's the most common location. Um, and that's typically seen kind of in athletes, uh, gymnast throwers are kind of the lead groups that I, I see this in. And so those are the, the common patients, but on occasion, you may think you're looking at a uh, kind of a radio capital OCD, but if you look closely, you may actually have a central necrosis problem, whereas uh, the center part of the elbow and sometimes even the medial part of the elbow um, may be a much larger zone of involvement. So be careful not to miss that. If you're thinking you're looking at elbow OCD, you might actually be looking at a term that some people have described as fishtail necrosis. It may be a more broad blood vascular disruption uh, of the distal humerus that may be after a minor fracture or maybe unknown cause in the past. So if it's primarily in that radio capitellar joint, that's probably what we think of as osteochondritis dissecans. In the veterinarian world, they refer to it as osteochondrosis. Uh, but be careful not to miss a more broad-based avascular necrosis of a larger component of the distal humerus, which is probably a different disease process. Yeah. And so when I was reading on this, so when we kind of talk about elbow OCD lesions, or I guess just in particular lesions of the capitellum, some are saying that it may be due to, you know, recurrent micro trauma, for example, um, versus what you're talking about, where you have more of os osteonecrosis of the entire, you know, entire distal elbow. Is that you just said sometimes that could just be seen with fractures or this kind of idiopathic, no real and any risk factors or anything for that? Um, I, I think so. You know, they, uh, your point about what we think of this as an athlete and maybe a cartilage problem, I think that the bone problem may start first and then lead to okay. the cartilage problem later. I suspect there are people who are out there with OCD, potential lesions of the elbow, but because they aren't gymnasts or throwers, they may never overload it enough to cause a mechanical failure, at least maybe not early in life. And so I, I think there are probably some people who have predisposition to developing OCD because there may be some areas of compromised blood flow, but because they don't load their elbow enough, they may never develop the clinical symptoms. I think the same thing may apply to the elbow uh, or rather to the elbow, the knee and the talus where people may have an underlying condition that could develop into OCD under the right mechanical loading circumstances or the right you know, athletic sports environment. But I, I think there's probably some elbow OCDs out there that are asymptomatic. And I've had cases in which I've obtained elbow x-rays for various different reasons. Um, and they do have an OCD lesion and they have absolutely no history of symptoms. And in many cases, they weren't necessarily doing a sport that would load the elbow. So I think there may be people with ha that have silent OCD potential lesions, but they're not overloaded to the point where we unmask the mechanical symptoms, pain, delamination, things like that. And so, you know, when these patients come to your clinic and, and you're seeing them, you know, we just talked kind of about the etiology and, and some of the pathoanatomy behind these OCD lesions. When you're seeing them in your clinic, when patients talk to you, what do they typically say? And then what, what questions do you ask them? Like, what is, you know, what's your history exam um, like in the OR, not in the OR, in the, in the clinic when you're talking to these patients? Yeah, I think probably the, the two things I see most commonly, at least early on, is pain. And in many cases, a little flexion contracture develops and it may only be five or 10 degrees, but you can really see a difference. And sometimes in gymnasts, uh, younger females may actually hyperextend five or seven degrees or more on the other side. And so a five or 10 degree flexion contracture is really in some ways a 15 to 20 degree flexion contracture because they've lost their hyperextension. And so early on it's pain and maybe subtle loss of full extension. With time, sometimes it progresses to more mechanical symptoms. They may occasionally feel a little clicking, uh, mechanical uh, movement, sometimes even a little crepin in something they can hear. Uh, and then sometimes it press the point where it's an obvious loose body. And sometimes they can even say, hey, I, I think I can feel something moving around. And occasionally they can actually push it around on the lateral aspect of their joint. They'll sort of find it in that little soft spot back there. But the, the, the mechanical symptoms are kind of mid to late, the pain and loss of full extension are the earlier symptoms. And once they've got that, that pain and that loss of extension, I'm usually concerned that they are going to get worse and their ability to continue to do the sports they love is probably going to be compromised. You know, and I was wondering why it would be extension loss. At least when I was reading, it was saying that 
in throwers or athletes see a common place to have these lesions of the anterior part of the capitone, which I would imagine if you're in full extension that you may be more on the more posterior aspect of the capitone. So, you know, just interesting thought. I'm not sure why it's the uh, extension. Maybe, you know, maybe you have more insight than me, but, um, you know, that, I, I thought that was interesting as well. Yeah. You know, in terms of location, a couple of interesting things we learned, um, gymnasts who tend to weight bear with their arms fully extended. They don't tend to walk on their hands when their elbows are flexed, right? Because right. it's hard to support your body weight. So you hyperextend your elbow, you lock it in place, take advantage of that mechanical stability with a hyperextended elbow and you load the more poster aspect. And so in gymnasts, it's not an absolute, but in gymnasts, most of the time I see lesions more posterior on the capitellum, which in some ways are easy to get to if you have to do surgery on them. Uh, the uh, throwers tend to have a kind of the mid to anterior part or more anterior part of the capitellum. And I'm not the only, I'm, there are other people who've made that observation as well, but I think baseball players, when I think of the, you know, the peak of throwing, you know, the valgus overload of the elbow, the elbow is much more flex. And so I think they're loading the mid to anterior portions of the elbow when they're throwing at peak velocity and peak acceleration, whereas gymnasts are loading more in full extension. And so I think the sport itself may drive the position of lesions. Um, Min Coker and his colleagues had a nice paper on baseball catchers a few years ago, and I'd actually ironically seen a couple of baseball catchers that had poster OCD lesions. Catchers, as you know, tend to sit on their hyperflex knees as part right. of being a catcher athlete. And then Min, of course, soon published a paper showing a large number and Min was spot on. I think he showed that that position of overload may be one of the drivers of where the location is. So gymnasts more in the poster aspect of the elbow, throwers more in the anterior mid aspect their elbow and catchers more in the poster aspect of their knee so it, it may be that mechanical overload position that drives the development or unmasking of a ocd predisposition yeah and are you normally seeing this in adolescents and younger patients or are you seeing these in, the, in sometimes in adults as well uh, all all the above okay. I, I think i would say the gymnasts i i think that i see the gymnasts and throwers typically somewhere between eight nine and about 12 13 to start with um, I've seen plenty of eight, nine-year-old gymnasts and 10, 11-year-old pitchers um, uh, with these lesions, but I think they tend to become more symptomatic as they get older. Um, and then, of course, I've seen a number of, you know, you know, 22, 25-year-olds who have this as well, and they're usually thrower athletes. I don't see as many gymnasts because I think if you're a gymnast at 10, 12, 14, you probably have you know, uh, aged out or moved on to the sports because the OCD took you out earlier. I've seen baseball players who I think can make it longer. They may mm. not, elbows may not fall apart as early as the gymnasts. Um, I, 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 and, and I've seen that a lot where I've seen a number of symptomatic throwers show up at 14 to 22 um, at the first time of their symptoms, whereas gymnasts seem to show up earlier. And so I think the, the gymnast elbow takes them out of high level competition earlier. Oh, ah, okay. So, so say, you know, we have our 14 year old male, that's a thrower that's in your clinic. He's just been having just, you know, elbow pain. Um, now he's having some symptoms of crepitus and, and clicking and, you know, you're, you're concerned for an OCD lesion. What, what do you do next? What do you, what type of imaging do you obtain? Are you getting x-rays? And if so, what x-rays are you getting? And then what are you looking for on these x-rays? Yeah. And I, just a routine AP lateral view um, will pick up yeah. most lesions you know, um, you could argue that you know, different flexion extension positions might uh, reveal some lesions, but typically an AP lateral. And I, I spend a lot of time looking at both because sometimes you can't see it on one, but you can see it on the other. Um, and you just have to look very carefully. The lateral view in particular, um, if you look carefully, a lot of times you can pick it up on the lateral view. There'll be a subtle suggestion in the AP view and you go to lateral and say, wow, it's, uh, it's pretty obvious here. Um, I do get a lot of MRIs. In fact, almost every elbow OCD at some stage, I'm going to get an MRI. I may not be at the first visit, but even so I'm tending to get more on the, on the first visits. Um, MRI is just a very powerful tool. I don't get CTs as much. And it's not that I don't think CTs are valuable. I actually think CTs can be really helpful, but um, I'm in a, in a center where we get a lot of 0.6 millimeter slice thickness MRIs. And so the ability to detect free bodies with 0.6 millimeter slice thickness is pretty easy. Some places get three millimeter, even four millimeter slice thickness. And so that's where I think the CT scan can pick up those small, small bodies, especially if they've got some ossification in them. But the, 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 the thing about CT scans is I, I'm, I, um, I'm always very aware of that radiation dose. And right. even with the, you know, the LR principles, you know, the lowest possible dosing approaches, it's still, 
is a fair amount of, of radiation compared to plain x-ray and obviously no radiation with MRI. So I, um, I don't get near as many CTs, um, but I get a lot of MRIs. And once again, I'm in a center where we have 0.6 millimeter slice thickness on many of our MRI uh, um, uh, selections. And so we can actually pick up free bodies on those. And, and so you just mentioned free bodies that you could pick up on the MRI, but in your eyes, when you're looking at an MRI scan, you know, what are, what exactly are you looking for? Like, you know, what images are you looking at? Um, are you looking, is your go-to, you're trying to look at a sagittal on a T1 or what exactly are you looking at? Or what are some things that kind of make you concerned uh, when you see this on an MRI with OCD lesions? Yeah. You know, um, I, I tend to go through the whole MRI every time T1, T2, proton dense, you know, whatever they've got, chronal, sagittal, and axial, because I, I frequently learn something from each different image. Um, and, and, I, and I think it's helpful to look at all of them. Um, there is a T2 star image, uh, which I'm working to get that on our elbows at my current institution. Um, I've used that on the knees in the past, and it's a special image that it's a sequence that actually looks like a CT scan. It's remarkable. You look at it and say, well, that's a CT scan. You say, no, it's a T2 star image, but I think that T2 star image, uh, Ella Uterman up at um, Dr. Uterman up at uh, University of Minnesota has done some remarkable work on that T star formats, and she can help train your radiologist to use that sequence. But it's a very helpful sequence combined with all the other sequences they get. But I think getting a really good three dimensional understanding is helpful by looking at chronal axial uh, and sagittal views, uh, especially if you're planning surgery, it's really helpful to do that. And also by looking at multiple images, um, you'll pick up free bodies that you wouldn't have picked up on uh, one of the other sets. So I tend to look at all of them and, and, I, and I, I usually look at them with the family, but not infrequently. I have seven, 10 minutes of time between cases. I'll look at them before the family comes in and then go through them with the family again. But I encourage you to look at all of those images. I think they can all provide helpful information for you. Yeah. And yeah, I totally agree. Look through all the images and get all the information that you can. And so, you know, say you have this patient that they, you know, we got an MRI, they have an OCD lesion. What do you go about next? How do you, how do you decide what kind of treatment you're going to go, whether you're going to go non-operative or operative treatment at that standpoint? Yeah, I, I think there's a couple of layers. I think first, um, uh, understanding their sport, their goals, you know, um, and if it's an early stage, season, I'll give an example of baseball players. I see this a lot in, um, in the young kids who are throwing their pitchers and sometimes catchers. Yeah. And with pitchers in particular, when I look at the baseball field, who throws the hardest, the most often on the field, it's a pitcher who's right. second, the catcher, the catcher has to throw back to the pitcher every time he throws. So their volume of throws are high. They don't always throw as hard, but they're also throwing to second base and doing things as well. So um, the catcher and the pitcher have the most elbow load. The shortstop uh, has a fair amount. Third baseman outfielders do, but second base and pit and first base in particular, um, don't have the load. And so one thing I'll talk to families about is if I don't think it's uh, fragmented, the MRI doesn't show a break in the cartilage. I don't see a free body. I think there's a prognosis or a good prognosis for some healing. I'll say, can we switch it to second base or first base? If it's a small athletic patient circuit, second base makes a lot of sense. Sometimes first base wants a taller, longer person who can reach far for a high ball or low ball that's come mm -hmm. in to throw out the first base runner. Um, so I'll, I'll sometimes talk to them about switching to those positions. But I think in some ways, anything but pitching and catching is probably better. I'll just say, hey, maybe we can uh, have you, you know, play another position. That way you don't take them out of the baseball uh, field or take them out of the baseball sport that they love because the psychosocial impact of taking sports away from kids is significant. So trying to compromise, keep them on the field, but minimize their throwing and minimize the overload on the elbow. And I've had some success with kids do that for a year or two. And sometimes they go back to pitching and their elbow looks better. Sometimes they're comfortable no longer being a pitcher and they'll be fine playing second base or first base or a little less demanding position. They're just happy, I think, to keep playing baseball and not to be told they can't play baseball anymore. Um, if they present with more advanced symptoms, uh, mechanical symptoms, free bodies or clear breakdown of the cartilage, then I'm more likely to progress uh, to some type of a surgical procedure. Um, so that's sort of my baseball protocol. My gymnast protocol is, is similar, although it's hard to tell a gymnast, you got to stop doing certain things that load your elbow. You know, the, a lot of things they do require them to fully extend their arm and engage the hyperextended elbow while they're doing, um, you know, floor routines and, um, you know, balance beam and everything else. And so it's a little harder to unload the gymnast. And so, um, that's a little tougher thing. Sometimes 
I've switched to other sports. I've had a number of gymnasts who have become divers uh, because they have all the athletic ability and the kinesthetic sense to become really good divers. And when mm-hmm. you're a diver, you don't put the load on your elbow. I've had a number of six gymnasts who couldn't, uh, couldn't do gymnastics anymore, but they became very good divers. I've had a few gymnasts become good pole, pole vaulters, which would seem to put a lot of load on the elbow, but I've had a number of do well making that transition because of OCD. But it's hard sometimes to keep the gymnasts in with a non-surgical approach uh, just because uh, they're loading the elbow every day. And they also tend to be, you know, in practice is anywhere three, four hours a day, sometimes five to six days a week. If they move up, you know, from that level six to level seven to level eight, they just have to put a lot of hours in to maintain that ability to continue advance in their sport. Yeah. And I think that those are really important points you just made um, about talking with the patient and figuring out what their goals are and what they want, you know, out of, out of a sport, or if they can even change positions. Cause uh, you know, sometimes, uh, or I, I could see how it could be easy to say, Oh, you have this, well, this needs surgery. If you want to continue to do what you, what you're doing now versus, Oh, well, they're, they're kind of fine switching positions and, you know, being second base or outfield or whatever else or whatever other um, thing they may do. Or I like the, I didn't even think about, switching a gymnast to diving or, um, or pole, pole vaulting. I think those are, those are good tips for those that are listening, especially those that are interested in sports. I hope you're taking some good notes about this. And so say, you know, say that they still want to continue doing, doing what they're doing now, but they do want to try some non-operative treatment. What does that, what does that look like? I know we said that we would switch uh, positions, but is there anything else that, that you would do during that time? Yeah, I, I think, uh, once again, the psychosocial aspects of kids, trying to keep them involved in something. Maybe they have another sport. Maybe they also play soccer and say, hey, soccer is a great sport for elbow OCD. Uh, you're probably going to be fine. <laughs> uh, but, you know, trying to it, taking kids out of sport is really emotionally traumatic for many of them. Yeah. So finding a backup sport or letting them do something um, physically active, if they're comfortable switching to another sport or they have a second sport that they do maybe encourage them that as part of their break. Um, in terms of uh, loading braces, I don't use a lot of elbow braces. Okay. Uh, for the gymnasts, uh, I, I'm more inclined to use those for the knees. I may use unloader braces for the knees, but not as much for gymnasts unless families really want to do that. I think, you know, taking them out with or without a brace, I think the outcome will be the same. Now, um, I, I think, it, you know, the open growth plate issue is, and uh, we think at least certainly in the knee, Open physes are better predictors of healing. Uh, closed physes are also uh, worse prognostic fi- signs for healing. And so the younger the child is, the more open their physes are. I think their prognosis is better. We don't have as much prognosis data on elbow OCDs yet. Um, Don Bay, um, Carl Nissen, uh, Charles Chan, one of my colleagues out here, and then Masahiro Murayama, an orthopedic surgeon, elbow specialist in Japan, We've been increasingly doing some work on trying to understand elbow OCD better using ultrasounds, both uh, for diagnostic and prognostic purposes. But Don Bay and Carl Nissen and some others have done some remarkable work uh, expanding the elbow OCD group uh, from the knee OCD group. So the the knee, the rock uh, focused knee group is now becoming the rocket. They're focused on knee, elbow, and talus. And hats off to Don Bay and Carl Nissen for all the hard work and heavy lifting they're doing to take some of the lessons learned from prognoses in the knee and try to apply them to elbow. We've got to build a bigger database of elbow OCD patients, but that's currently going on. And hopefully we're going to have some more information where I can say your type of lesion with these either x-ray or MRI findings, your physeal opening status predicts you have a 40% chance of healing or a 90% chance of healing. If I can counsel the families with that type of information, we can decide you've got a 94% chance of healing based on everything we see here probably don't want to have an operation. Let's give it time to heal with those odds. Or there are other factors we look at and say, you got a 22% chance healing, which means a 78% chance of failure. You might say, I think I'm going to opt for earlier surgery. And so our goal is to get to the point where we can um, kind of predict for families what the likelihood of healing uh, based on their child's lesion, and then help them make a decision about surgical, non-surgical treatment that makes sense for their own preferences. Yeah. And, and so in your clinic, um, you know, what, what patients do you see that you're like, okay, well, it's, it's time to operate on this. You know, like this is something that we should go ahead and take to the operating room um, and, and fix this or, or assess it or, or whatever else it may be. So what are your indications for operative treatment yeah. for these OCD lesions? I think uh, symptomatic mechanical symptoms with a free body 
is uh, in someone who wants to maintain participation in their sport, I think those patients are almost all of them are going to progress to surgery. And that's partly a clinical assessment, but usually an x-ray and MRI and occasionally a CT assessment. So at that stage of the disease, free bodies, detached cartilage or cartilage flaps that are causing mechanical symptoms, I don't think those are likely to get better if they want to continue to be an athlete. If they're going to give up sports altogether. Their symptoms may be tolerable, but um, they'll probably still have some mechanical symptoms. But patients who are not at that stage will may still try some non-operative treatment based on what the MRI may show us or, you know, kind of what the family's or patient's goals are. Right. And so in your, in your head, so what are the different, you know, operative treatment options for you? So say, you know, you have somebody that have a free or loose body or, you know, they're, they're adamant, they want to undergo operative treatment and you think they're a candidate. What are some of the different options that you can, that you can uh, use for treating these operatively? Yeah. Um, you know, I, I think there's a lot of different ways to approach it, but uh, I have not found many elbow OCDs amenable uh, to fixation. Um, yeah in part because the quality of the bone and cartilage is not very good. And most of the time when I felt they had pretty good bone and cartilage, I've treated them with subchondral bone drilling alone in part because access for screw fixation is a little more challenging in the elbow compared to the knee. Uh, but I've, I've also had very good results with a lot of elbow lesions that were early on without a break, a break in the cartilage or almost normal cartilage. Um, and, uh, the MRI is not too concerning. There's not fragmentation, really significant, significant signal change in the cartilage, but I've had very limited experience with fixation, screws, K wires, absorbables, whatever right. in the elbow compared to other joints. Most of my uh, patients have been either uh, um, a judicious excision of unstable fragments, a uh, trim of unstable fragments and microfracture and drilling. And, and I've been a little bit surprised how well some of these patients have done even though their joint doesn't look great, they've done pretty well with the breedment um, and, and drilling. And I tend to do more than abrasion chondroplasty. I'll frequently drill uh, in many cases from back to front uh, with a K wire, watching it come into the, the site, just because sometimes that's technically easier to do. Uh, I don't, uh, microfracture picks don't always work as well. And sometimes the lesions are smaller than you might see in a knee. Um, and if that, if that doesn't work, um, you know, there are other options, uh, osteochondral grafts, uh, osteochondral allografts, oats transfer from the knee. Um, my, my experience has been oats transfer from the knee. I've not done it from cadavers, but I know Carl Nissen and other people have had experience from lateral femoral condyle uh, cadaver, uh, fresh uh, cadaver tissue really? plants, but that's kind of a bone cartilage uh, uh, restoration, if you will, because you have bone and cartilage from either a osteochondral autograft or or an allograft uh, or uh, an autograft from the patient's same knee. I don't have any experience with the rib heads, the cartilage of the rib heads, but I know some people are reporting uh, reasonable results with that as well. Um, there are many countries, including Japan, where access to osteochondral allografts is very limited, if not impossible. Uh, Masa uh, Hiro uh, Murayama does not have access to osteochondral uh, allograft tissue. So his choice uh, is going to be autograft tissue in all cases. Yeah. And so just to rewind, so you're saying, you know, some of, you know, fixation of these is, is most lesions are going to be amenable for that. And so you may excise it. And then you said you'll do some subchondral drilling. And so you do anterior grade, right? Is what you're, was what you're, what you were describing where you're coming from. Uh, yeah. So you can front. do retrograde or anagrade, but I tend to do more anagrade than retrograde. Okay. And so what are your, what are your options for an oats lesion? You know, when are you going to, when are you going to do an oats procedure? I'm sorry, excuse me. Uh, when are you going to do an oats procedure for these patients? You know, what size of the lesion does it, does it need to be in yep. order for you to say that? Um, I think a couple it's, uh, and, and I, I still don't fully understand who should go to an oats first versus who should go to debridement. Uh, I recently reviewed right. a paper for one of our major journals it hasn't been published yet, but it will be, but it was a, a relatively large series, a little bit over hundred patients treated a consecutive series of arthroscopic debridement without oats. And the results at two-year follow-up were better than I would have thought. And it maybe made me think that, that that procedure gets a little better outcomes in than perhaps I thought. But um, I, it's still not entirely clear to me when I should go to an oats. Um, yeah. I will say that a lot of gymnasts come into my clinic wanting an oats. And I think there may be a lot of gymnast literature out there in which uh, you know, websites and blogs where other families have talked about what they have done. And it seems a lot of the gymnast patients come in saying, hey, we think we've done our research. We think uh, we would like to go to an arts. Can we, can we get that done with you? Um, 
Whereas the baseball players are, I haven't had as many baseball players come in and ask for oats. Um, and so maybe that's partly the culture of the gymnast versus the culture of the, of um, the baseball players. They think one versus the other, but um, it's not always clear to me, clearly a failed subchondral bone drilling or a larger uh, area, uh, larger defect. I may be more likely to think about a, uh, I know it's uh, a transfer from the femoral condyle, which is what I typically do in my practice is that you do native tissue from their own knee. Right. And, and Dr. Shea, what is that? Con- I know sometimes these conversations can be difficult when, you know, the family comes in, they say, we want oats, but you're looking at the images and you're like, I think this could probably be okay with just some, this microfracture. I don't know if it's quite that big. And so what's the conversation like when you don't necessarily, uh, I guess you could say, agree with, you know, with what they're asking for? Like, how do you, how do you manage that given yeah. you know, your years of experience? Great question. And, and I, um, and I think, you know, we're all trying to do patient family centered care. And um, I, th- I think probably the most important thing is that even if you feel quite strongly about a different course of treatment, the family does, I think listening to them very clearly and answering their questions um, and, and be very open to their suggestions and uh, be willing to entertain other suggestions, but also be willing to communicate your own views and perhaps your own perspective as to what you think is better. But, um, you know, some people are not going to change. They want to do things, but sometimes um, if patients feel you're really open to listening to what they're offering and their, their reasons for doing so, and you approach it with a very open mind set and a way you communicate, a lot of times they're willing to change based on the fact that they they think you really listened to them and took their, took their preferences and concerns to heart. And um, you weren't set in your ways. You were going to, this is what we're going to do it because this is the way I want to do it. And so I think it's partly the psychology of communicating, building trust, building a relationship. Um, The other thing I might say is that in the absence of clear evidence sometimes um, where I I might think this is better, but I'm not sure. And what they're proposing is reasonable, even if it's a little different than what maybe my one first choice, I might be willing to go along with it if I think it's pretty reasonable. If it's something that's clearly not reasonable, I've had patients with minimally displaced clavicle fractures who tell me they want their child to have surgery. And I, I tell them, you know, to me, the risk benefit balance there is so far off that that fracture is going to heal. Um, it really isn't going to heal any better with surgery. And then you undertain or you undergo a risky procedure that might have complications, hard removal, whatever. Um, and so if it's really kind of unreasonable, I'm going to kind of hold my ground. I'll be respectful and polite about it, but I'm going to hold my ground. But if it's something where it's a little less clear, either in the literature or my own experience as to why uh, a, a debridement and a Marrow stimulation procedure may or may not be better than an oats. I'm going to listen to the family and, and may let them, you know, talk, yeah, talk me into may not be the right way to describe it, but I may be more willing <laughs> to go along with what their stronger preferences are when I don't really have strong evidence. Um, and, you know, sometimes our experience we think is strong evidence, but, um, you know, sometimes I'm, I'm, I'm very willing to kind of go along with the family and change a little bit. Um, and it's just, it's kind of the art of medicine and you'll get better as you get more experience, but, uh, taking time to really listen to patients, look them in the eye, listen to the patient, look at that nine-year-old, 10-year-old, ask them what they think. Um, a lot of patients have told me, my, my, my 10-year-old daughter, I couldn't believe that you looked at her and talked to her and asked her what her opinion was. And, and um, so I think we as physicians should really, you know, seek that. You can't do that with some kids, but with a lot of kids, I think you can. And there's a lot of young kids who really have a stake in these sports and other things. And I think talking to them like they really matter is a really good message to send to them. And you'll also learn a lot from them. Right. Yeah, totally agree. And another gem for those that are listening, I hope you again, you're taking notes. And um, one of the last things that, that I want to ask you is just kind of long term, you know, how, how do these patients do long term? Do you know, they even have high elbow arthritis in the future? Or do they do pretty OK? I know we mentioned a little bit earlier that you're, if your physis is open, you you know, they have greater than 90 percent, you know, 95, almost 90, 95 plus percent of uh, having a good result. But, you know, long term, how do these patients do? Well, a couple of things. Um... I, I think that open growth plates, while it is a positive prognostic thing, um, I don't know if 95% of people I've seen with OCD with open growth plates end up doing well. Okay. Especially those who stay in sport. So I think that number is optimistically high. I don't think it's that high. Uh, and I do think the numbers is not doing well after skeletal maturity. Um, yeah, they, they don't do as well if they're going to stay in their sports. If they switch to another sport, they may do okay. But as you know, there are some studies looking at long-term degenerative changes in the elbow uh, with OCD. And it probably is a condition that's going to set you up for some degenerative changes, motion issues, um, maybe a little synovitis in the future. And so, I, you know, I, 
one of the conversations I have with family is that I'm, I'm always thinking, I know the short-term sports career ahead of you is very, very important. And we're going to focus on that. But I also want to focus on what can we do for the long-term healthy elbow when you're 35, 45, you want to teach your own child to be a gymnast or your own child to throw a baseball. You know, what can we do to think long-term as well? And so I, I think counseling families about both the short-term sport goals, but as well as long-term elbow function, what can we do to maximize the chances of you having a better elbow 20 years from now, not just three or four years from now while you're trying to play your sport. Yeah. And I think that's a really important point that you just made. I know one of our attendings here always, uh, always tells us or lets us know, you know, patients say uh, he hasn't had many patients that are upset with him, you know, when they have a complication, if beforehand you let them know like, Hey, these are possible things that can happen. uh, You know, if you have this procedure or, you know, with this condition versus if they feel like they're kind of somewhat blindsided and you never told them beforehand that they could have any type of complications and, you know, they come down the line, they're having elbow pain or, you know, whatever it may be. Then at that point, they may be a little bit more upset, but I guess that kind of goes into the more of the art of doctoring and, you know, managing and talking to patients and, you know, just kind of setting uh, expectations. Yeah. I think your comment about setting expectations, you know, Steve Frick has said for years is the best way to get better outcomes with surgery is lower your patient's expectations. And, there's, there's probably a little bit of sarcasm in that, but I think there's also a lot, there's a, there's a kernel of truth there as well. And be honest about what we can do. Um, and I think asking patients about, you know, what are your real goals? Um, if you want to have these three or four things, um, I want to know what those are. And if I think I can deliver on those, I'll tell you. But I think if they're asking for three or four things and you think you can deliver on two, I'll tell patients. And a, a great example is patellofemoral issues. I think we've got really good solutions for patellofemoral stability for not all, but for an awful lot of patients we see now, but solutions for pain relief for patellofemoral dysfunction. um, I don't think our pain relieving procedures are as good as our kneecap patellofemoral stabilizing procedures. And I'll tell families that, that if your primary goal is pain reduction, I don't know, or if you want complete pain relief, I don't know if I can give that to you. If you want better stability, I think I've got better operations for that. And so letting people know what you can achieve Because if a patient goes into operation thinking my knee pain, my kneecap pain will be gone and my kneecap will be perfectly stable. That's how I define a successful outcome. And that's how it'll take me to be satisfied. I think they're going to be disappointed. But if you let them know ahead of time what you might be able to accomplish versus what you can't, I think it's very helpful. And your comment earlier about one of your attendants who would, you know, if families knew ahead of time about potential complications or shortcomings or limitations of the procedure, they're more likely to be happy. Hey, we, I knew I wasn't going to have a perfect result in terms of pain relief or in terms of playing professional baseball as a pitcher or in terms of other things. I think really finding out what patients want and then really trying to make sure that what you can deliver aligns with that. And if it can, great. But if it can't, tell them, here's what I think we can do. Here's what I don't think we can accomplish. And I just want to make sure you and I both understand that clearly before we depart on this, you know, partnership, this marriage, if you will, this marriage between a surgeon and a patient to see them through a difficult problem. Yeah, uh, very well said. And uh, Dr. Shea, I think this has been a great, you know, great podcast episode. I learned, I know I learned a lot just from talking to you and uh, a lot about these different OCD lesions, especially the elbow and the decapitellum. Uh, before we wrap up here, anything else do you want, you know, the people or the listeners listening to this to know about uh, elbow OCD, le- elbow OCD lesions? Um. Get involved with research on elbow OCD uh, because it's not terribly common in most practices. And the more people who are collecting data on elbow OCDs and sharing it with a larger group, the sooner we're going to solve some of these unanswered questions about elbow OCD. It's a, it's a you know, OCD is, is something that vexes all of us. I think we're making progress here, but uh, every time we answer a question, we get, uh, we get three more questions. So we feel like we're always running right. behind. Get involved. Um, read, join some of these groups, uh, try to make a difference. And uh, hopefully we can look back 10, 20 years from now feeling like, hey, we're doing a better job of treating OCD. We're getting better short-term and long-term outcomes for our patients. Well, Dr. Shea, it's been a pleasure to have you on the podcast. Uh, I really appreciate you taking the time out of your day to come on the podcast. And uh, thank you again. Well, Wendell, uh, Wendell, Dr. Cole, thank you as well. And uh, please call me Kevin, all right? (laughs) Will do.